Welcome, everyone. We have a terrific show lined up for you. I just hope to stay awake because I just got back at 5 o'clock this morning for a rather quick trip to Taiwan where I met with some business executives and a number of government officials, including the National Security Director for the Republic of China and the Foreign Minister. Now, over the past 30 years, since my days as Lieutenant Governor of Arkansas, I've traveled several times to this small island nation which with over 29 million people, is one of the most densely populated nations on Earth. Taiwan is a vibrant and innovative nation with a strong economy, a robust entrepreneurial mindset, and a leader in high-tech breakthroughs. My visit got covered extensively on the national news as the people of Taiwan feel strongly connected to the United States and what happens here. While people living in Taiwan think about America quite a bit, it's doubtful that most Americans think much at all about Taiwan. I would imagine that many Americans feel that people in places like Taipei need America. But what they may not realize is that America needs Taiwan. I mean, if you have a cell phone, and who doesn't, the chip that makes it work was likely manufactured in Taiwan. And if you have a modern appliance, a newer model car or truck, a laptop, it probably wouldn't work without the highly sophisticated computer chips that are engineered and manufactured in Taiwan. But as much as products developed there are essential to the rhythm of our lives, there's more reasons for Americans to be grateful for our friends in the land also known as Formosa. You see, Taiwan is a free republic. Its citizens are free to debate issues and decide in free and open elections. Who should lead them? There's freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of movement, and a free enterprise system that has created great wealth, but which has also created great paying private sector jobs. There's a highly driven focus on quality and competitive education, and its children are encouraged to set very high academic goals and then go and achieve them. Now, unlike mainland China, driven with an iron fist by the Communist Chinese Party, Taiwan allows free access to information and opinions that go with it. I still remember when my wife and I happened to be standing in Tiananmen Square in Beijing on what was the 25th anniversary of the uprising of the protests there at Tiananmen Square in June of 1989. And we were with this young guy. She was in her 20s. And we asked, well, what do you think of the events that had happened there 25 years ago, about the time she was born? I'll never forget, she gave us this puzzled look. And after a few awkward moments, it was apparent she had no idea what we were even talking about. Because that chapter in the so-called People's Republic of China, or Communist China's history, it had been surgically erased from every history book and website that were accessible to the Chinese people. She had no idea it had ever happened. Like Israel, Taiwan is neighbored by an enemy that has declared that it desires to destroy the independence and freedom enjoyed by those living in the Republic of China. But also, like Israel, it moves forward as a key economic and innovation anchor in the Indo-Pacific region. Now, it's comforting that there are some exceptions from the crazy wing of the Democrat Party here in the U.S., and there is overall a rare but strong bipartisan appreciation for and support for this strategic ally. I don't know if you know this, but even Nancy Pelosi, with whom I struggle to find areas of agreement, traveled to Taiwan a few years ago and expressed her support for our sister in freedom. And believe this or not, I publicly praised Nancy Pelosi for that, because when a political figure does right, regardless of who it is or what party they come from, we ought to publicly acknowledge it and applaud it. America doesn't live in a vacuum. We don't exist all by ourselves. And we really do need the productivity and ingenuity of people all over the planet who share our values and our virtues. Taiwan does. Honestly, I love being back there this past week, and I was reminded how wonderful America is. But I was also reminded that we really do have real friends on this earth. 
And yes, they need us, but don't ever forget, we need them too. My first guest tonight suffered the incredible and tragic loss of their daughter and son-in-law at the hands of a brutal gang while they were doing missionary work in Haiti. Married couple Natalie and Davy Lloyd were just 21 and 23 years old when they were shot to death in Port-au-Prince, Haiti after leaving a youth group event at the local church. Despite the chaos that had been unfolding in Haiti these past few months, that spurred increasingly dangerous situations. These young missionaries opted to stay behind and help. They refused to leave the orphanage without the children, and they stayed to protect them. With me now to share their incredible story and the legacy of this selfless and courageous young couple are Natalie's parents, Naomi Baker and Missouri State Representative Ben Baker. Give them a nice welcome. Ben and Naomi, I, I, I can't even begin to express not just appreciation for your being here, but then when I read your Facebook post right after that your daughter and son-in-law had been murdered in Haiti and you made the comment, you said they went to heaven together. I mean, I just, I, I was just overwhelmed with the emotion of a father and a mother who had to deal with something that you never thought you were gonna have to have to confront. Take us back to when you heard the news and what you heard um, about your daughter and, uh, and your son-in-law and what happened. It was a, it was a torturous time. Um, we were actually uh, at a political event uh, when we first heard the news that the compound there where Davy and Natalie uh, where missionaries had been breached by gangs. The gang activity has been completely out of hand. It's almost complete anarchy in Haiti. Um, and it had been getting worse. Um, but like you said, they chose to stay. And when we heard the words, Naomi uh, heard it first and came over and, and said, we got to go. You know, And at that point, we had heard that Davy had been beaten up by the gang, but, but Natalie was okay. And and we were trying to figure out what was going on, which is difficult, you know, with communication being here in the States and his parents also being here, Davy's parents being in the States as well. Um, but it was difficult because it, it was an hours long uh, thing that played out where we really didn't know what was going on and, and knowing that it was taking place at that moment, but not being able to do anything uh, for me, especially as a father, was one of the hardest things that that I had to deal with in that. Was most of the information coming from people in the mission compound? Was it coming from the US government, the Haitian government? Where, where do you even get information for something like this? Just from the people there. Uh, Davy and, and Natalie had tried to make contact with David, which is Davy's dad. Mm -hmm. uh, the other young man, Jude, that was killed as well. Um, he had a cell phone and they had been in contact with him some, but it was kind of spotty. Um, and then at some point they took their phones, you know, and they tried to go to another place that had a satellite phone. Uh, so there was just a lot of, it was just absolute chaos that was taking place. And so it was difficult to make contact. Naomi, as a mom, I'm sure you had misgivings about your daughter, Natalie, going off to, to Haiti, young couple, the whole world in front of them. Um, you might have even said to them, why don't you guys just stay here? What conversations did you have before they ever went to Haiti? And did, did you have deep in your heart some anxiety about going into a place that is notorious for being so very dangerous and corrupt? There was some misgivings and anxiety, yes, but mostly I just trusted the Lord. Um, we've always believed that if we put our kids in God's hands, that he would take care of them. Um, nothing prepares you for taking care of them, you know, how he would do that. Um, and trying to accept God's will and everything has been the hard thing because when you do give your kids back to God, you expect them to come back to you. And um, 
this time it wasn't, that's not God's plan. I have a feeling that every parent who's listening to us have this conversation is just feeling the gut punch, but not able to fully comprehend what you had experienced. I, I, I mean, I just, I have no words. I really don't. I, I'm just stunned that you're able to even process what you've had to go through. Ben, you just went to Haiti this week uh, with Davy's dad. The two of you went back. Describe that visit, what you saw. And it had to have been just a very difficult thing to go and be there where he and Natalie were, were murdered. It was. Um, I, I felt compelled to go. I've never been to Haiti. I've been to a lot of other places and done a lot of other missions work all over the world, but never been to Haiti. Had planned to go uh, with Davy and Natalie being there. But I felt compelled to go whenever David decided to go back. Um, I, I didn't want him to go alone, um, you know, dealing and grieving and, and still all of this up in the air with what the mission was going through there. Um, but selfishly, I think there was something within me that I just needed you know, maybe more information or, you know, I still struggle with this, you know, the, the why yeah. of this situation and I'm working through that. But um, I wanted to be there for the kids too. And just, I think it was just, I wanted to be close to the kids that, that Davy and Natalie were serving. I wanted to, um, you know, one of those little boys, I have a picture up on Facebook. Um, his father was shot and killed just a couple years ago. Oh. And Natalie had taken him in um, really to, to be a mother to him, and uh, and now he lost Davy and Natalie as well, and so um, I was able to just hold him, you know, and he's not understanding what's going on. But How old the, is he? He's just four, four, four oh. years old, I think, somewhere oh. around in there. And so, and the kids were thinking, many of them, and even some of the adults were thinking, well, this is it, you know, there's no more hope, the missionaries aren't going to return, uh, and so. Little did I know that what God was doing with that is really was trying to help them to see that there is still hope and that mm -hmm. the missionaries still want to be there and still want the work to go on. And so that was my, you know, message to the kids was, we love you. We, we, we want the mission to continue. Uh, and, and we're going to do everything that we can to make sure that that happens as difficult as this all is. Um, and so you know, it was, it was heartrending, but it was, it was good in a lot of ways uh, for me to be there, I think, for my own self, but also for the kids uh, and, um, you know, trying to, to figure out the way forward with this is difficult as well. I want us to continue this conversation. We got to take a break when we come back. I want to uh, discuss with you more about the life that you knew of your daughter and, and the great legacy even at a young age that she's left with her courage and the conviction uh, of her faith and how that helped her to be able to face this. Keith is going to tell our audience what's coming up on the rest of the show, and we'll be right back with Ben and Naomi in just a moment. Well, later tonight, Dr. Jonathan Chancer discusses the anti-Semitism rhetoric that's overtaking college campuses. And next, more with Representative Ben Baker and his wife, Naomi, on this incredibly touching story. Stay tuned. MikeHuckabee.com and sign up for his free newsletter and follow at GovMikeHuckabee on X. We're continuing our conversation with Ben and Naomi Baker, whose daughter Natalie and her husband were brutally murdered in Haiti, serving as missionaries there. When I think about how young these guys were, 21, 23, it's horrific as it is, to deal with the news. There's got to be some sense in which you look at your daughter's life and you feel an extraordinary sense of pride and gratitude 
that she was so filled with God's love, God's spirit, that she would put her life at risk for these kids that weren't hers. Until she went there, she didn't know them. Naomi, you're a mom. I mean, that must give you some sense of at least a joy in knowing what she lived her life for. Yeah. She was exceptional, even from a young age, uh, very responsible, um, which all of our girls make us proud. But, um, Natalie had a calling on her life early on, and it was clear. And um, she makes me want to step up my game, you know, mm. be, be better, do more, um, live more in the moment. Is it hard, though, at times to not be bitter? And angry, because I think a lot of parents are saying, I, I don't know if I could handle that. I don't know if I could be so filled with the grace and, and capacity to, to accept what they've been through. I think we're still working through that. Yeah. Um, there's obviously those human emotions. And uh, yeah, we're, we're going to be working through that for a bit. Um, I, you know, scripture tells us to forgive. And so we know we have to get there. But uh, we're, we're getting there. Davy had grown up pretty much on the mission field in Haiti. His dad was a missionary there. So this was somewhat pretty familiar to him, but not to Natalie. When she communicated with you, were, were she sometimes talking about what they were facing? Did you ever get the inkling that she felt that it was a dangerous situation to be there? I think they knew dangerous. You know, we talked about it. Uh, she knew that. Davy knew that. But it was, it's the way of life in Haiti. You know, it's been that way for a long time for them. And, uh, you know, you, the, the people there just learn how to cope with it. It's, it's awful to see this take place. Um, but, you know, we, when, whenever we would talk to them, that wasn't really the, you know, they weren't that concerned mm. about their, uh, their own safety. They were concerned about the work there. They were concerned. Nat Natalie, you know, one of the things she was concerned about was learning the language. Yeah. Um, in the last FaceTime conversation we had with them, you know, she was just beaming with joy because she was catching on mm -hmm. and uh, learning how to understand the, the language there, being able to communicate with the kids better. Uh, and usually when we talked to them, they were smiles from ear to ear, just, you know, happy and joyful uh, and really not concerned about the, all the things going on there. You guys have raised a remarkable young lady that is a witness to the rest of the world of what it means to truly lay down one's life for others and to serve Jesus in such a powerful way. What can we do to help you? How can we, how can we minister to you, help you, reach out to you, offer you condolences and assistance? Naomi, what, what, what would you love for the people of America to, to understand and join with you in? There's so much. <laughs> uh, we need a lot of prayer right now. Um, that's, that's our biggest need at this moment. Um, the grief has been something I, I never thought that I would have to go through. I thought my kids would bury me, you know. Um, so pray for us. Um, we want to see missions in Haiti go on because that, that was Davy and Natalie's legacy. Well, you're incredibly courageous and it's a wonderful tribute to your daughter and to your son-in-law uh, to share your story and to give us the opportunity to grieve with you and I know it's it's not going to heal it but to let you know that there are people all across this country who love God and who hurt with you for what you've had to experience thank you so much for being willing to come and tell this uh, extraordinary story of an extraordinary young couple. I know you'd like to keep up with the latest on this tragic story. You can visit State Representative Baker's guest page. If you go to Huckabee.tv, we will connect you, and I hope you'll reach out to them. Reach out to them with your prayers. And Keith, you have the responsibility of telling us who else we have coming up on the show. Well, coming up, Dr. Jonathan Chancer gets to the root of the evil creeping into American society. Then the hilarious comedian Dino Posey performs. You're watching Huckabee.
Samaritan's Purse is bringing life-giving help to families all over the world. Simple acts of prayer, volunteering your time, or giving financially to the mission of Samaritan's Purse, all are ways that you can offer your support. In fact, my own wife is in Rogers, Arkansas. She's there for her third deployment in the past few weeks as a Samaritan's Purse volunteer, all after the devastating tornadoes that hit Northwest Arkansas back in May. Because we've been blessed, you now can be a blessing to someone else who really needs you now. And you're going to find that the reward is great. If you visit the Samaritan's Purse website, or you can scan the QR code on your screen and find out how you can give or be a volunteer with Samaritan's Purse. You can also give them a call. I hope you will. Thanks, and God bless. Well, my next guest is the Senior Vice President of Research at the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, and an expert on all things Middle East. Please welcome Dr. Jonathan Shanzer. Dr. Shanzer, it's very, really timely for you to be here. So much happening in the Middle East, and yet there's also so much happening beyond the Middle East and Israel. Anti-Semitism is at a peak that we haven't seen since the Holocaust. Why? Well, we're seeing a really a concerted and organized movement that I think started on campus, it spilled out onto Main Street America, it's certainly all over social media, and I keep coming back to one group that I first testified about before Congress in 2016. Mm. I shared that information with two different committees, nothing happened, and then all of a sudden, we saw them burst onto the scene after 10-7, and they are the people that are the driving force behind the campus protests, this wave of anti-Semitism. And who, who is this group? Because somebody's paying for this stuff. I mean, they, they, kids are showing up on campuses, but they've got nicely printed signs. They have uh, uniformly well-made tents that they sleep in. I mean, that, that's not organic. It's not organic. It's not spontaneous. Uh, the group is called American Muslims for Palestine, or AMP. They're based in Falls Church, Virginia. They used to be based in Bridgeview, Illinois. Uh, but what's really interesting about them is that a number of their leadership used to work for charities that were shut down in the United States for Hamas finance. There were three different groups, one of which I worked on when I was a Treasury terror finance analyst in the early 2000s during the Bush administration. We shut down all three of these charities. And somehow some of the lower level individuals, the lower level employees, have come back together, they got the band back together again, and they're now heavily involved in the campus protests. We see them literally at University of Pennsylvania, George Washington University, Columbia University, Berkeley. We see them all over the United States right now, and they're holding the microphone, they're leading the chants, and they are behind a lot of the chaos that we're seeing right now on campus. So that's the organization. Who finances them? Who gives them that money? Because there's some big money in in this. Well, that's the interesting thing. I don't know if it's big money. Uh, the organization doesn't claim to have a large budget. And if you think about it, what do these students need, right? I mean, they need pizza, they need some tents. We're talking about a few thousand dollars here. Now, I think the real question is the organization itself. How big are they and how much are they active on each one of these campuses? Students for Justice in Palestine was created by AMP. When it started back in 2006, there were only a handful of SJP chapters. Today, there are more, more than 250 across the United States. This was a serious grassroots effort that took place over the course of about two decades. I don't understand. I mean, college kids are supposed to be smarter than this, but they've apparently been sold and brainwashed on the idea that Israel is an apartheid country, that it's brutally attacking people who are Palestinian, which, which is a made up term from 1962 and Arafat. So how are they so effective in persuading these college kids uh, that they're on the right side of history when they are clearly on the wrong side of history? You know, I, I grapple with that all the time because when you see the sorts of things that they say, the kinds of anti-Semitic yeah. remarks that come out of their mouths, the signs that are calling for an intifada, which is basically calling for an armed uprising, um, the idea that you can get away with this in today's day and age is shocking to me. The fact that they've ignored the slaughter of 1,200 people on October yeah. 7th, they've ignored the rape of Israeli women, the killing of Israeli children, I, I, I still struggle with it. 
Uh, Dr. Sanzer, I think what you're doing is incredibly important. I hope you'll continue to root out the sources of the money. Who's paying for this? Why are they doing it? Is it coming from Iran, from Qatar? Uh, somebody's got to be writing some checks to make this stuff happen. And I hope a lot of parents will say to their children, we're not sending you to a school that thinks this stuff is okay. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you'll go to Huckabee.tv and click on absolutely give him a good hand. He's doing the Lord's work for sure. If you go to Huckabee.tv, if you click on Dr. Shanzer's guest page, you can follow the latest news on the activities that he's uh, working on on all of our behalf. Keith Bilbrey, I know there's some comedy on deck, and I think we could use some. Tell us who it is. Well, stay right where you are. Funny man Dino Posey is next. Then Brylan Hollyhan talks about his new book and his fight to restore American freedom in the younger generation. Just go to Huckabee.tv and click on free tickets. And welcome back, everyone. Dino Posey has an unusual day job for a comedian, an executive vice president of a Fortune 500 financial company. But he's also a husband and dad whose clean comedy is relatable to everyone. He's worked with stars from Steve Harvey to the Ohio Players. We like him so much that this is his second appearance on the show. Would you please give a great welcome back to Dino Posey. Well, hello, how is everybody doing? So happy to be here. I drove up uh, from Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, all right, I got my Alabama folks, listen. My bladder and my gas tank are connected. <laughs> because about the time my bladder gets full, my gas tank gets empty. And so I stopped at my favorite place when I'm traveling, a place y'all may be familiar with, a place called Bucky's. Oh, I am obsessed with Bucky's. Listen here, no line, no waiting for gas, buddy. They got 172 gas pumps. You will run out of gas in Bucky's parking lot trying to get to the next gas pump. It is absolutely amazing. You can just drive forever trying to find a gas pump. You'll be in the next county, but still at Bucky's looking for a gas pump. And listen, they got everything you could ever imagine in Bucky's. You can buy clothes, jewelry, food, drinks, everything, toys, hunting gear, everything. I walked around Bucky's just enjoying myself. And the people in Bucky's, have you noticed the people in Bucky's? It's like Disney World. It's just like Disney World. They're just walking around, wandering around, happy people, smiling and everything. They're dressed better than Walmart shoppers, but not, but not as bad, as, not as good as Cracker Barrel folks. They're kind of in between. In fact, Bucky's kind of reminds me if, if Walmart and Cracker Barrel got together and had a kid, it'd be Bucky's. What do y'all think? I, I think that's how it would go. They have got the longest car wash in the world. After I grabbed all my snacks, I took the car through the car wash. I had enough time in that car wash to eat two of those brisket sandwiches and drink a big gulp icy in there. And just had the best time in there just going through buckets. I, I prefer driving and traveling because I don't, when I travel because I don't like to fly. Um, I don't really get nervous about flying, but I get nervous about who's gonna sit in the seat beside me. It's always, you know, you gotta get your seatmate right. And so it's, once I pick my seat, well, here's what my wife and I do actually. So when we fly, there's three seats. I sit in one, we leave the one empty, and then she sits in the other. And so as people start coming on the plane, we start arguing. <laughs> Nobody wants to sit in the, in the middle of that. So we, we just have a nice, good fight right in the middle of that right there. And then we'll look up every now and then and see if we look, see somebody that looks like they may be fitting and be a good seatmate for us. 
But what's weird is some people look at us and go, no, I don't want to sit by them either. <laughs> so that's why I drive. Um, I got to tell you, I'm getting excited about this election. Are y'all getting excited about the election coming up? I don't know. I don't know. We, we down to two candidates now, and I, I don't know who I'm going to vote for. It's kind of hard. Like, choices are kind of, eh, I really don't know. I, I, I tell you what, I would even be willing to, to do a write-in campaign for this guy. What do y'all think? <laughs> Look. We talk about it. I try to find a way to line up on his politics. We'd be okay, I think, but it's, it's, I don't know. And so, like, I want somebody that would unite the entire country. That's what we need right now. I think we need somebody that will unite the entire country. I want somebody, you know, that just is going to be good, kind of middle of the road, and that would be my candidate. And I think I found my candidate. Uh, the person I think I'm going to vote for is someone who hopes that life treats all of us kind. And they hope that we all find everything that we need. This candidate will wish all of us love, joy, and happiness. But above all this, they'll just wish us love. So my candidate is Dolly Parton. That's who I'm... What, what are y'all thinking? Can we support Dolly? Listen, I am just so excited to be here. This is, this is one of the greatest shows ever, and TBN does a great job of doing this. Uh, I got to get back to my grandkids. I've got eight grandkids um, and one on the way. Yeah. Being a grandfather is hard, but here's the weirdest thing about being a grandfather. I, I'm okay with being a grandfather. I just didn't envision my future being married to a grandmother. That's, that's kind of the part I didn't deal with. Listen, thank y'all so much. My name is Dino Posey. I never thought about that idea of not being married to a grandmother, but it kind of goes with the territory, doesn't it? It, it goes with the territory. Hey, it's great having you back, Dino. And by the way, you can catch Dino Posey July the 13th at the Birthday Bar in all places, Talladega, Alabama. Absolutely. And you can also follow him on social media. Why don't you book him for your event? That would be fun. Just visit Huckabee.tv. We'll hook you up with Dino, and you'll be able to invite him to your town and have an event with him. Right now, our executive vice president of announcing, Mr. Keith Bilbrey, is going to tell us what is still ahead on the show. Well, up next, author Brylan Hollihan joins Mike at the desk, then get ready for the fabulous music of Voices of Mobile, right here on Huckabee. TV and get your very own Made in the USA Huckabee mugs, t-shirts, and more. Well, we come back to the phenomenal music of our favorite band in all the country, and that, of course, is Trey Corley and the Music City Connection. Let's give them a big hand for making the show even more fun. Rylan Hollyhan founded the conservative news service, The Truth Gazette, at the ripe old age of 11. 11 years old. Hey, Keith, you know what? When you and I were 11, we were still eating paste and following the mosquito truck around on our bicycles, remember? Uh, uh. We didn't have a fog machine. In no, but you didn't. we were eating that paste. Yeah, we were eating the paste, but we, we rode our bikes behind the mosquito fogger in Hope, Arkansas. <laughs> Well, Brylan became the chairman of the RNC's new Youth Advisory Council and gave some advice on winning the youth vote to some top Republicans, including President Trump. Now, at the more mature age of 17, he's already written his first book. How about that? It's all about helping save young Americans from leftist indoctrination. The book is called One Generation Away. Why now is the time to restore American freedom. Please welcome the wise beyond his years, Brylan Hollyhan. Brylan, it's great seeing Thank you. you. Governor, appreciate it. I think I first met you when you were 11 years old. Yes, sir. It was. It was at Scott Dawson's fundraiser in Birmingham, Alabama. Absolutely. You've got a great memory of that. But here's what I'm just stunned by. Most teenagers 
are not thinking about politics at all, and if they are thinking about them at all, it's usually left of center. Sure. What made you embrace a more conservative view of America at age 11? <laughs> Actually, it even started a little bit earlier than that. At the age of 10, it was the 2016 presidential election. I was in the fourth grade, and I turned on the TV one night, and one of those fiery debates between Trump and Hillary was on. And it kind of drew me in. It was that hmm. election cycle that pushed a lot of people away from politics. They thought that it was too divisive, and they were right. I mean, we thought 2016 was about <laughs> as divisive as yeah. it could get, and look where we are now eight years later. So I got interested then. I said, look, I think my generation has a unique opportunity to unite the country. I think coming into this, we can you know, kind of unite the country, get us involved. 2016 drew me in. I vividly remember having a mock election in my elementary school's library. And it's surreal because now this election, I get to vote for the first time. So it's a full circle moment. Huh. And I'm just excited to be in Nashville with you. That, that's pretty cool. <laughs> now, did some of your friends when you were... 11, 12 years old, say, Brylon, what's wrong with you, man? Let's just talk about football and girls and forget about politics. Were you kind of different than a lot of those kids? Sure, you could say I'm different, Governor. You could say I'm a history or political nerd. I will say I'm born and raised in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. Football's in my backyard. So I bet it is. Definitely yeah. still a lot of SEC college football. I don't I'll have to ask you if you're Roll Tide or War Eagle. I don't know where you're coming from. Roll Tide, Governor. Tuscaloosa, for sure. <laughs> The book is called One Generation Away. A lot yes, of sir. people may not make that connection to Ronald Reagan. You do in the book. Yes, sir. Why? So Reagan's famous quote is, freedom is one generation away from extinction. Mm -hmm. Governor, this book is a culmination of seven years of traveling this great nation. Seven years of talking to as many Americans as I could, but more importantly, listening to even more of them. Mm. And Governor, what I've heard time and time again, and I know it's the same thing you've heard when you give speeches across the country, is that people don't have hope in this country. They don't have hope that their children or grandchildren or my peers are gonna grow up in a generation where they can have a free America to live in and to raise their families in. And that's a sad state of affairs. Yeah. So what I continuously tell my peers every time we give a speech on a college campus is look, if you don't have hope in this great nation, I do. Why? Because I put my hope in Jesus Christ alone, not in any D.C. bureaucrat, mm. and that is a message of this book, and that's where I'm trying to get it out there. And what a wonderful reminder that ultimately human elections, and they are important. Sure. I mean, I obviously believe in them, and you do too, uh, but we have to look beyond just who we elect, and we have Absolutely. to start thinking about spiritual renewal and revival in this country because we have a, a moral crisis and uh, a, a crisis of the conscience of so many young Americans. What kind of reaction do you get when you give a conservative message to your peers? Do they say, hmm, never thought about that before, <laughs> or do they throw things at you? So I think we're seeing, I've seen them firsthand on college campuses, we're seeing it reflected in polling, that my generation is moving conservative, which is breaking the mold. I mean, for, for decades, yeah. in 2003, the DNC has had a stronghold on my generation when it comes to election cycles. That's changing this time, Governor. I mean, what we're seeing is, you remember, you know, graduating high school, registering to vote, uh, you know, renting your first apartment, mm -hmm. going off to college, all of these things that are big pivotal moments in life my generation's going into that era of life under a Biden administration and a Biden economy. Governor, my generation doesn't want to grow up in an America where it's the standard to be able to send your political opponent to prison when they're beating the polls. We don't want to grow up in an America where it's standard to be able to kick your political opponent off the ballot when they're beating you in the polls. My generation doesn't want to grow up in an America where law and order is just some TV show, not the actual standard here in this great country. And that's what we're hearing from people. It's a resounding message. And actually, I've even had dozens of people in the past few weeks as we finished this college campus tore up before the summer starts, say, look, my parents voted for Biden in 2020, or I voted for Biden in 2020, and I cannot make that mistake again. And we're seeing that reflect in the polls. And I think it's going to be a historic November. Is, is a lot of it the economic issues, or yeah. is it also the, the issues of a dual justice system? Sure. What's driving it mostly? Sure. I think it's a mix of a lot of things. Yeah? And I think two really big things happened for my generation, and it was in COVID. I think COVID taught my generation how bad big government was. Mm. It showed us how much control how much control the government could have over our lives if we let them have it. And we did that in 2020. We saw that they could make us strap diapers to our face, make us stay in our homes for years at a time, not invite grandma to Thanksgiving because mm. you're a terrible person if you do, not go outside. I mean, we saw, they, they kept us out of school for a year and a half, Governor. That is the, ref, uh, the effect directly of big government. My generation's seen that, and we've turned conservative since then. And also this border crisis. My generation doesn't want to grow up in America where our borders are wide open. And yeah. I think the Lake and Riley murder, it was brutal, it was violent, and that really was personal to my generation. That was on a college campus in the great state of Georgia that's not a border state. Yeah. And people saw that, hey, if that can happen somewhere, it can happen to me. This is personal. Biden's policies are directly affecting the American citizens. And ever since then, we've seen a major shift in polling. 
I think all of you can now better understand why I think this young man <laughs> may be president of the United States someday. He's well on his way. This incredible book written by 17-year-old Brylon Holly Hand is called One Generation Away. You need a copy for yourself and every young person that you care about. We appreciate your endorsement. Well, thank you. I was happy to endorse it. <laughs> and uh, I'm one of the folks that is written in a book as an endorser. How do you get the book? Well, go to Huckabee.tv. We will give you links to the book. And you can also learn how to follow Brylin on all social media platforms. That's our show for tonight, folks. Go to Huckabee.tv for more information on all of tonight's guests and to see an online exclusive performance by Voices of Mobile. If you enjoyed this video, I hope you'll consider clicking the subscribe button below and the notification bell next to it so you don't miss any of our future videos when they go up online.